Hello, everybody. Welcome back to 101. You can find us at 101podcast.com. We are here with our best friend, John Lasauer. Hello. Hi, guys. John, what do you do? I am a composer of music for film and television and concerts. And anyone who will have me, I'll write music for them. That's sort of my, my thing. And I'm also a performer, but these days it's mostly composing. What sort of projects have you done? Well, I guess I'm on my 30 something film, 34th film score. Wow. And, and I've done a bunch of documentaries. I just finished one uh, about Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. And I'm starting a new one about Huey Newton and the Black Panthers in Oakland in uh, 1970. Wow. And uh, I've done a lot of movies from very large scale to uh, indie films. Uh, I've done uh, student films, which I love doing. Um, student directors are very open to all the possibilities. They haven't become jaded and become <laughs> limited by the demands of either the, the producers of the production company or the uh, film company. The bigger th films get, the more restricted and tight and less creative they get often. I found that uh, much too often. So I like small films. I like indie films and I like the occasional big film when they um, don't tell me to be John Williams, which <laughs> happens a lot. I also write music for things like ballet and the concert stage and for uh, instrumentalists. And I've written a symphony. I've, I've, all I've done since I was really about 18 years old is write music and perform. And I do a lot of recording in the studio. I used to do a lot of TV commercials. I mean, a lot of TV commercials in the, in the heyday, as well as um, produce, arrange, and play on record albums. And I did a lot of those until I sort of broke in uh, to the, the Canadian film industry and the Hollywood and New York film industries. So now I'm just floating on the phone calls, which means to us, uh, somebody calls and says, you want to work? And we say, oh, yeah. So, I mean, I know you, John, but I also know that you have such an expansive career and like experiences. So I'm just going to take you a couple steps back. So you started as a musician. What was your first kind of job in this realm of, uh, of scoring and composing for film or commercials or anything like that? Well, I was a musician since I've been very young. Um, I was a clarinet and saxophone player, and I still am. I still play in symphonies and do jazz concerts and have fun. But when I got to college, I became a composition major. Uh, and a pianist. And when I was 19, I had been to San Francisco with my dad and heard an amazing singing duo called Al and Julio. And Al was Al Jarreau and uh, one of our great uh, jazz and crossover singers. And he had never been recorded before. And I was a, a fiery 19 year old enthusiast. And I invited him back to New York and we made records. That was my first real I'd been in the studio a bunch of times doing little stuff for people, but this is my first oh, project because Al is great. And from there, uh, I loved it so much. I sort of became, I, I was, I continued to be a student and I was given uh, a year to write a symphony at college, but that meant I had a lot of time to be in New York, to be in the recording studios. And I started making records and doing television commercials. I hadn't done a, a film yet. The films came along about four years later. I was working with Leonard Cohen and one of his protégés named Louis Fury. And uh, I started scoring their movies. Before I did any movies in the States, I did French Canadian movies, which did very, very well. One of them won a Genie, which is an, a Canadian Academy Award for best score. Then I started getting some small films in New York and uh, I was off to the races. I was swamped with work and then, uh, I started to do some what we call ghost writing for a, a, another composer who was very successful. And then I started getting films of my own and I decided I liked that the most. Uh, scoring movies let me do the most amount of things that I do. I got to play a lot. I composed, I even I wrote songs for the films and I was able to uh, produce the recordings, conduct them. And some of them were quite large, everything from two musicians to 105. I did some big Hollywood scores. And then COVID shut everything down for us. And it was kind of the twilight zone for us musicians because we weren't uh, 
able to work because the studios were closed, but we also couldn't even perform. We couldn't play, we couldn't play in clubs, we couldn't play in the symphonies. So we had 13 months of practicing <laughs> or, or experimenting. So I, I got into a lot of new kinds of sounds and new techniques uh, for computer-based orchestral music. And then COVID lifted and uh, we're swamped again. I know that you started playing music at an early age. When did you know that this was your gig? Like, what was the moment that you knew that this I, is for me? It, it's, it's amazingly simple to say. I grew up in a pretty musical family. My stepfather was a jazz piano player. and I was always going to hear him play with his buddies and it was just wonderful. So he was the jazz guy. My mother was the classical one. So I would hear everything from Stravinsky to Art Tatum all day long. So I was playing everything and I, and I got good in a hurry because I just you couldn't keep me away from these instruments. But they, everyone suggested that I not go into the music world because you starved. You know, I mean, everyone I know who's a musician, including my dad and all his friends, they were just getting by. I had gotten into uh, an Ivy League school with the best music department on the planet. So it was sort of always in the back of my head, but I thought maybe I'd be an architect. Uh, I always enjoyed architecture and composing are very similar. It's conception and realization and it's structure and design and flair. And that always fascinated me. I used to draw a lot. And I thought enough of that. Uh, so when I got to college, I took a, a music composition course and I placed into a second year course. And my teacher was, a, a certifiable genius uh, as a pianist and a composer. She was just one of the one of the big wigs of the 60s and 70s and 80s. And she took me aside after two or three days and she said, so I think maybe I'll be your advisor for the next couple of years. I said, what are you talking about? I said, I, I might I might not do music. She said, what are, you, what are you talking about? She said, you have no choice. She said, you're a composer. Don't even tempt yourself with anything else. Uh, she, I, she says, I see this every once in a while and uh, just clean your mind of all the other possibilities and I'll be your advisor. And she was for four years. And, and in one day, chain made my mind up for me. She told me and she assessed what I was doing and why it was a little more special than this usually came across and why, how my mind worked. And I was, she said, you think like a composer, you are a composer and you keep doing things that are fresh. So it was one afternoon in her office that just made me say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And uh, it was only about six months before I got in the studio. So she was right. <laughs> so influential, these people that we spend day after day with. It also just goes to show that like teachers are such like invaluable influences in the lives of students, hands down. When teachers collaborate with you and make you feel like an equal partner in the thought process, yes. that's when it's really stimulating and uplifting. When you're collaborating, if you're not trying to prove anything, you're stimulating each other rather than trying to outdo each other. I love that. I, yeah, I think more people should be collaborators in this industry. So John, I want to hear about, you know, let's say you get this new gig, you're going to be composing a feature film. How do you start your day? What is your day-to-day -day responsibilities? How do you set up a project? Uh, before the day-to-day -day starts, there's a whole yeah. bunch of steps before you get down to it. The temptation is, oh, let me see the film. I got these ideas. <laughs> and before you're even halfway through the film, you've got melodies in your head and you're writing scribbling notes and stuff. I learned early on that you have to avoid the temptation to do that. The first thing that happens when you've secured the relationship that you're going to work with a director on this film and maybe you've read the script uh, usually i like to do that before seeing even the rough cuts because the script tells you what they thought they intended <laughs> and when you actually see the rough cut you see how it morphs uh, into something visual so you're talking to the director and the screenwriter usually sometimes an actor but usually the, the director about what kind of effect they want the movie to have uh, what the impact is, and what they think the music should do. Then hopefully you get the film in a rough cut that is close to a, a, a final cut so that you get an idea of the flow. Then you do something called spotting the movie, which is breaking it down into cues. The composer oftentimes will guess where the music will go, or sometimes you'll get a movie where the uh, director will have sent you 
all the scenes that he thinks he wants music for. And you, you make a sheet, a cue sheet, and I make them up for every different movie. It has cue number, cue title, start time, end time, description, and you put down your various thoughts. And then you take the cue sheet, send it to the director, and you go through it painstakingly, scene by scene. This is before you've written a note of music. And then you load the film into your, if you're working in a, with computer films, which we almost all are now, I do part, um, what we call MIDI sequencing, which is computer sequencing to set things up. And then I do as many real instruments as I can, sometimes a whole orchestra. And then I bring it back to my studio and do some editing. And maybe I'll add some of my man-made sample sounds and unusual things or sound design. Ordinarily a film that, that's a, an hour of 40 minutes will have maybe 60 minutes of music, maybe 50, maybe an hour 10 it all depends uh, and when you know how much music there is you know how special it has to be when you're basically sure of your first run through they have everything you have everything you get through and watch it and you go through and decide what works and what doesn't hopefully everything is uh copacetic because you've worked it out with the powers that be ahead of time and you've introduced them to all the elements. And then when you say, okay, everything is good, then you do your final music mix. And the music mix sometimes is, if it's a small documentary, it's just a stereo mix for small theaters and television. Uh, a while back, we got into what we call 5-1 and 7-1, which is theatrical mixing, surround sound and all this. But that all, all those mixing elements get done initially at the music recording studio. Then those elements, which are then striped out, which means we have high strings, low strings, percussion, solo instruments, voice, they, those elements all go to the film mixer who sits around with all the voiceovers, all the acting dialogue, all the effects, all the ambient noise and your music score. And they put the whole thing together so that's the that's the whole process. I know that's about a ten minute answer to the simplest question, but I, I always wondered like you get a cut and you're like, wow, I really wish that this just this scene cut out like two frames earlier. Like why? Like and you can't say anything. Well, you 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 can. Okay, you. Yeah, you can because sometimes uh, the editor has lived with it so long that they've lost objectivity. We have to be able to say stuff. Just like I had an editor to say to me. Uh, a film that really re required some humor to it. He said, you know, it seems to me that you're trying too hard to make that funny. And at the time I had thought that, but the director had liked it because it was kind of goofy, but I had thought the same thing. I said, oh, maybe it's, maybe I'm, you know, what do you think? And I said, you know, I agree, thanks. And ordinarily, you know, editors don't call up composers and say, um, Mr. Williams, uh, I think there's too much <laughs> French horns in that action scene. No, no. But it is when you trust each other and it's a family and the end result is all that you care about. Uh, we have to be able to say stuff like that. What is the best part about your job? Oh, uh, it's different every day. That's why. I mean, that's <laughs> the best part is that it's never I never have to repeat myself. Uh, and I'm always doing something that I hadn't done before. I did a movie back about 15, 18 years ago called David and Layla about a Jewish boy and a Persian girl. They fall in love. It's actually a true story. And I had to score the movie with kind of a little klezmer band, which is really not my thing. And also, I got four Persian music musicians who were at uh, Juilliard in Manhattan School of Music to play really authentic music from that region. So I got to learn, I had a crash course in Persian music. You know, they were uh, Western musicians also, but they were from Iran. They sat on the floor in my studio. They brought rugs and we had everything. We had uh, incense and stuff and we made a little environment. And man, you can't have a better learning experience than that. So, yeah, that's so cool. Now you have a whole catalog of other instruments. Oh, you... yeah. It's not generic. Mm -hmm. And and it's actually insulting to your part of your audience that you are diminishing by just doing something that sounds vaguely uh, Bedouin. Oh, yeah. Lazy, it sounds like they, yeah. they could be on camels. It's lazy. You're not being specific enough. Yeah. yeah. You're doing a period piece that's about 
the 1780s, well, you don't want to use Brahms classical music. It's got to really be yeah. from that period. Well, now you have like Bridgerton, which is like fusing, yeah. you know, 18th century and new age pop music. And rightfully so in a way, because that's, um, that becomes very saleable. One of the things I think that works so well for Game of Thrones is that regardless of the three to 500 year time span that seems to constantly be going around to it, is they're using music that's vaguely large and seemingly from hundreds of years ago, but combining it with massive percussion audience uh, uh, ensembles and things that would never have existed then, but it makes it a breakthrough hit now because it hits the you know 18 to 30 year audience. What would you say the, the most difficult part of your job is? Sometimes it's really finding out what the intent of the picture is. But a lot of times, uh, if I'm just dealing with a director, the director will assume that everything is so obvious because it's, the picture's in front of you. And they may not actually know what it looks like to fresh eyes. So the hardest thing is to know what the job is. Then you just have to rely on your imagination and your technical know-how and your experience to be able to come up with something that satisfies that. So John, this is a question that Meredith and I are really, uh, we feel like it's so important because there's a stigma around it specifically for women, but also I think for creatives. So we are going to talk about just pay because as a creative, as somebody who has talent, who has lots to offer, it's important to be compensated for what you do. And we want our listeners to approach their careers with a courage to talk about their pay and what they deserve. So what would you say, and I know this is like a difficult question to answer because it is varied. What is the average pay range that a new person starting out in the business can expect for a job? Uh, it depends on the job, of course, but maybe you can talk a little bit about that for our listeners. Somebody said to me very early on, if you want to score movies, don't quit your day job. And what they meant was, you're not going to start to earn a living uh, doing your early movies. A young composer will see these things first. Uh, student films, composing for student performers, composing for student uh, dance companies, with an eye and imagination of reusing it later. You're just getting your feet wet. It's a chance to try some things out. Then you get a chance to work on some shorts, either still in the student world or uh, shorts, animated shorts that are professional. And you try and get a sense of what their budget is and you work your way up. And if you're any good, uh, better and better people with better and better projects will want you to do it and your pay scale goes up accordingly. And sometimes it jumps around. Sometimes you'll get, um, I never got into the, the big Hollywood films where the composers are making $3 million and the music budget is $8 million. Uh, if it's really a, a bootstrap independent film, it might only be $1,500 or two or $3,000 at the bottom, or it might be $50,000. It really depends. And to me, the most important thing is, do I love this movie? Do I want, do I like the people? Is it going to be fun? If I have to worry about, can I pay my rent from this? Well, my day job should be doing that. Hence the don't quit your day job. I was always lucky enough that I had so many things in my recording career that I could just keep doing record sessions and not do that film because I didn't like the situation of it. And I didn't need the money because I had something else to come in. You know, musicians can also teach. They can do a lot of different things. They can do television. They can do uh, music for web productions, which are music for, for games. So as much as you'd think that there would be a standardized fee, I know a lot of people who won't work for less than $100,000 on a movie. Uh, I know people that would kill to get a movie that paid $100,000. I know people who would only work for a million dollars and up. So uh, there is no easy answer to that. I always say, follow your heart. I was so lucky to have you compose my short film when I was in um, my master's program at School of Visual Arts. It was a short, you know, 12 minute film, but you elevated it so much. And it was so good, Meredith. That's, yeah, that's right. That's how this came about. 
And that's how you came to us, actually, yeah. Yeah. because through Meredith and um, we somehow convinced you to do the music for Three Bound. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the movie right off the bat. And I like you guys. It was one of the best times I've had uh, because the movie was just so charming. And it and it made me, it inspired me to write a, a kind of music that I hadn't done before, really. Well, I think that we should discuss um, a, a difficult question to answer, but what do you think needs to change in the industry? Uh, budgets have gotten so big, but the percentage of a budget that goes towards music and music production, even though the total budgets have gotten astronomical, have not even risen in proportion. They've stayed the same. Everyone says, ah, oh, they can do it all with computers now. Now, it used to be when you went into the studio to record, you had a 50 to 100 piece orchestra, and what you had composed had been cleared. You played a rough version of it for powers that be, and it was done. And it's getting harder and harder for us, and we can't we used to be able to have assistants and all our own engineers and assistant engineers. The budgets have gotten so much smaller uh, and the expense is so much higher that we're doing a lot of things ourselves. Now, uh, if I wanted to do something about it, I would stop composing music and I'd be a union advocate or something. I can't. It just bugs me that they're using the computer uh, computerization of music to denigrate our value. How the, is that going to be changed? Probably not. It's probably going to get worse, uh, just to be realistic. And I'm not going to devote myself to yelling and screaming because I'm I'm a creative guy. I'm not a business. I wouldn't. Need, I'd be terrible at that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know so much of what you said resonates with us. Making a film takes so much talent, and you know Meredith and I have made films in the past, and we appreciate everyone bringing their own talent. So I'm hoping that it gets better rather than gets worse. That's my, and, my hope for the future. And, <laughs> and as an addendum, what I just said applies to actors, uh, editors, costume designers, everyone who isn't the big money people, because here's the real problem. The big money people want more big money. And it's the same uh, earning gap that we see in society. Even the, the highly paid actors uh, are getting all that money at the expense of everyone else. It, the disparity is too wide and good luck solving that problem anywhere. Yeah. I don't think it's happening these days. I'm really happy that Will Ferrell declined doing Elf 2 um, because he <laughs> would have made millions, but he knew like, no, this is not worth, worth it to put people through that. I know that there are far less women uh, composing films um, as there are men. And I, I don't know enough about it to speak to it, but I was hoping that you might be able to talk a little bit about that. I don't know the answer to that. In a lot of ways, um, it was a man's world as composers in general. If everyone does a list of the 20 greatest classical composers and there are no women there uh, because women weren't voting till you know, World War I let alone being able to be responsible. They weren't able to act on the stage. They had men in drag acting as women. So it's a catch-up game. We have a number of fabulous women composers who have been hitting the Academy Award uh, stage as well. I don't know why it hasn't attracted more or allowed more young women to get into it. In the same way that why aren't there more uh, women conductors, orchestral conductors. And it's a big deal. And Natalie Stoltzman just got the job with the New Jersey Symphony. And it was headline making because it was the first time that a woman had, con had been chosen music director for a major orchestra, not even a major major one, ever. And I said, that can't be. No, I'd, and it was. I said, this is 2021. So it's role models. It's breaking up the good old boys club. I think about when I first came to New York and was hiring orchestras, the orchestral sections were 98% men, an occasional woman violinist. Now the New York Philharmonic is 50 or 60% uh, females in the string section. One of my best friends on the planet was really the first female engineer in the recording world. And she did a lot of breakthrough recordings, Laurie Anderson, Peter Gabriel, and Leonard Cohen stuff. And it was earth shattering. 
oh, you're using Leanne. And now I must know personally 10 or 12 women engineers. It's just, I guess it's time. So hopefully mm -hmm. this changes every month, every week, every day. We can't control the speed of that, but I do see that coming. Thank you. That, yeah. that makes such a difference. John, one final question for you. Yeah. Uh, do you have a, a favorite film, favorite movie? Yeah. I, I Can I name a bunch? <laughs> one of them uh, is interesting to me, which is Vertigo, because uh, the composer of that is Bernard Herrmann, who I think is one of the great film composers ever. He did all of Hitchcock's movies, or most of them. And he was the bravest of film composers. He was not going to be told... Uh, that's too crazy. Uh, Vertigo is just the most romantic, over-the-top Tristan and Isolde type film score for a very interesting movie that took a while to catch on. We think of Vertigo now and it's on a lot of people's uh, great list. But when it first came out, it was not North by Northwest. It wasn't one of Hitchcock's immediate uh, hits, but everything about it, I just find thrilling. There's all the layers of stories and so that's a composer's movie. The other thing that I put down on that list was Apocalypse Now from a movie maker's point of view. And when it came out, it was in the middle of Deer Hunter and a number of other great Vietnam movies. But when I saw it, 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 it did everything a movie could ever do to me. But there was a grittiness to the film and the sound design. And when it wasn't it was sound design, I mean, um, the composer hired someone to work to create concrete sounds to go along with the composition. So it wasn't, you weren't humming tunes in that movie, but the music and the sound design was moving you forward in an elusive and terrifying way. Everything kept happening. Whenever you got a little bit comfortable, uh -uh. either the music or the editing or the dialogue and the action and the bravery smacked you around. And I found it to be the most stimulating movie that I'd ever seen. Just ridiculously vivid and um, quotable. So two. <laughs> two. I mean, that that's pretty good. I feel like that's one of the hardest questions that we oh, ask people. Yeah. Everyone's like, I, I, I like so many films. I don't know how to answer this. Well, sir, thank you so much. It's thank been you. an absolute pleasure. We are so fortunate that you took the time out of your schedule to talk to us and talk to our listeners about the world of composing and how to get started, how you got started and young women out there, be film composers. <laughs> yeah, film composing, it's the most thrilling and wonderful and rewarding and complete careers I can imagine. It really isn't a career, you're just doing what you love. And uh, I'm so lucky to have stumbled into all the various parts of it. And, and uh, I would encourage anyone who's who is driven to do it, just stay with it and it'll work out. And thank you guys so much for having me. I love you both and I love your work and we always have fun and we can all laugh. <laughs> thank you, John. Time. We yeah. love you thank too. You. Thank you so yeah. much. This was a real pleasure. Thanks for having me. For those of you listening who, I don't know if you checked out our website or us on IMDb, but John, he created our music for 101, which we love. And my kids are particularly huge fans. <laughs> that was the highlight, seeing the kids bopping to it. They I said, bopped oh, yeah, to it. They, I did it. And they ask for it. <laughs> they yeah. ask for it. They're like, can we listen to the, you know. <laughs> yeah. So rewarding. Thanks so much, guys. <laughs>